Well, thank you, Janet, for that prayer. We are continuing our series on Acts. We've been looking at the early church and how the church grew from um, the, the ascension of Jesus and the, the command to go and make disciples to um, spread the be witnesses to the end of the earth. And so now we, we've seen Jesus come at Pentecost. We've seen how Jesus has, or sorry, how, how the early disciples have have shared the message of Jesus, and, and Peter's message at this point has been consistent. He's shared what Jesus has done. He's told people of their need to repent. Um, he and John were arrested because of their preaching and healing of a man at the temple. And so now we are come to a, a passage today where we're really going to contrast two parts of the church. First, we're going to look at the church in this early stage and the unity and the the togetherness that they had. And then we're going to look at the, the first recorded sin that the, the church has as we look at the end of chapter four of Acts and look at the uh, beginning of chapter five. So we're going to start reading on in verse 32 of chapter four. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me or you can follow on the screen. And it says, all the believers, were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. What a, a beautiful picture of the church! They're they're together. They're united in one heart, one mind. They are working together. Anyone who has need, they're they're um, selling their possessions. They're giving so that way they all all their needs are met. And it's not because they're good. It's because the, of the grace of God and what God has doing in them. And it's it's interesting because these aren't people who have been in church their whole lives. Yes, perhaps some of them are Jews and they grew up in, with a faith in God. And then they have now put their faith in, in God through Jesus and what Jesus has done. But these aren't people who have been um, Christians for a long time, if you want to call them Christians. They hadn't quite been named Christians right now. They're really just followers of the way, followers of Jesus at this time, um, but they put their faith and trust in Jesus and is really only weeks old. You know, when we see somebody who first comes to know the Lord and they're only a few weeks old in their faith, you know, there's still those growing pains of trying to, to see their old self um, out and live in their new faith in Jesus. But these Christians these people who are following Jesus, following the way, who have been baptized and, and following the apostles' teaching, just a few weeks, and this is how they are. They're following um, the teaching. They are in unity. They're in one heart and mind. Such a, a beautiful picture. Not only are they unified, one heart and mind, but they're also they're practicing um, sacrificial giving. You know, they're, they're selling properties, as we'll, we'll see um, when Barnabas in just a moment, how he sells properties and give it to the, the um, apostles' feet. We have people selling homes and land so that the, the needs of the church can be met, the needs of the people that might be met. And I, I've shared it before, how in this time, many of the people had traveled to Jerusalem for the, the Feast of Pentecost, and then they have accepted the teaching of Jesus. They've been baptized, and they've become part of the church, and they don't want to go back to where they were yet. This is where the apostles are, the ones who had been with Jesus. They're teaching. They're sharing. So there was money needed so that these people could stay, and I, I shared a few weeks ago. I mean, we can go on holidays, right? Most of us can afford to go on a short holiday, but a lot of us wouldn't be able to go on a, a year-long holiday. 
you know, the, the, the amount of money that is needed to support people for long term away from home. And the needs are being met because of the sacrificial giving of the people. They're, they're, whatever needs there are, they're being met because people are in one mind. They're united. They want to help each other out. They, they are aware of what's going on. This is a, a new thing. They've been believed in God perhaps their whole lives because of they grew up as Jews. In this, this stage, this is mainly a Jewish church. There may have been some, some Gentiles at this stage joining in because of where they taught was um, at, a, at a place where Gentiles were allowed. They, they were teaching again on Solomon's porch, Solomon's we see that further on in chapter 5. That, that's where they're doing their teaching. They're teaching on the kind of outer courts of the temple. Gentiles would have been involved there. But we don't really see a lot of Gentile um, in the church at this stage. It, but very soon it will be. So these people, they believed in God. And now they are recognizing who Jesus was because of Peter's teaching, because of the disciples' teaching. And they recognize that Jesus was the Son of God, that it's through him that we have salvation, that we are made right with God. We have forgiveness of sins. We have the punishment of the wrath of God is no longer on us because Jesus took it. And so this is what the early church is there. And they are wanting to soak up the teaching of the disciples. They're in one mind. They're listening. They're together. And it's a very... Um, wonderful time in the life of the church and when we we read this how my heart says oh that's what i want for our church that's what i want not just for blending community baptist church but the church of god which goes beyond denominations which goes beyond you know these walls the, the family of god are to be unified one heart one mind now look we have many different denominations and denominations Allow us to meet together, share beliefs, but um, at some point we have to recognize that denominations are there, but the kingdom of God is bigger than that. And I've shared before when I spoke to all the different churches about you know, that, you know, different um, denominations. And look, there are, are Christian denominations, what I'm talking about. You know, I, I, I'm not saying like, um, Mormons, you know, or, or other groups like that, but the, the Christian or denominations, we, we are all part of the family of God if we put our faith and trust in Jesus and we, we truly believe in what Jesus has taught. And we are called to be the church of God, but we are called to be like this early church, one heart, one mind. Um, and Paul writes in Philippians 1.27, he says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. That's Paul talking to the, the Philippian church. He's talking to the church there in Philippi, asking them that whatever happens to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. When you think of the gospel of Christ, this is the, the saving message of Jesus. And we are to live in a way that's worthy of that. It's a very high calling. It's a high high price that we, we pay to say no to ourselves, to live for Christ, to, to live not only for Christ, but to live with others around us, to live in a way that's worthy of the gospel. Now, this was a, a wonderful time in the church. Unfortunately, that didn't last super long. It didn't last real long. We, we see that in, um, in Corinthians, we look at Corinthians 6, the church in, in Corinth had gotten to the stage where, where they were even suing each other. There was so much conflict within the church that people were suing. Um, we look at 1 Corinthians 6, 1 through 7 says, If any of you has a dispute with another, do you dare to take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the Lord's people? Or do you not know that the Lord's people will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not, um, not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that when we judge angels, how much more 
the things of this life. Therefore, if you have a dispute about such matters, do you ask for a ruling from those whose way of life is scorned in the church? I say this to shame you. It is possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute among, between believers, but instead one brother takes another to court and in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? So here we have this early church unified together. No one has need. And then just probably a few decades later, here Paul's writing to the Corinth church to an estate where there is are people within the church suing each other, the Christians suing each other because they can't um, come to a consensus for that. So this is the church. We have two pictures, and we're going to look in um, Acts chapter 5 at, at, at where the first recorded instance where sin enters the church. I'm sure there was sin in the church before this because the church has always been full of people. And so when it's full of people, there is sin there. But what we can learn from this passage is the, is the seriousness of sin. And so let's look at just the last two verses of chapter 4, which sets this up. Now a man named Ananias... All right. Where did it go? Okay. Oh, I disappeared. Um, I'll just read verse 36 and 37. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostle called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. This is a little bit of a, um, a, a prelude to the story we're going to read. So Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas. This, this is the, the Barnabas who will eventually be traveling around with Paul. And so he is there at the early stages of the church, and he has done something. He has sold property. He's brought that money. He's laid it down at the apostles' feet. Okay? And so this is what people have started to do. We, we've just looked at it in a few verses before that, how that's what people were doing. They're selling things, selling property, selling land, and bringing it to all who had need. It specifically talks about Barnabas. Barnabas here does this. And, you know, if someone in the church brought a huge sum of money, there would probably be a bit of a, a buzz about it. Somebody, you know, not that we need to be thinking those things, but in the early church where people are bringing it down at the disciples' feet. There are the people around. They see it. Wow. Did you see what Barnabas did? You know, and hopefully they were going to praise God. Look at the, the faith of Barnabas to, to do that. But there was probably also, wow, look what Barnabas did. Look at the attention Barnabas is getting. And in we enter two people by the name of Ananias and Sapphira. Okay, and let's, this is the story. That's the prelude of what's going on in the church. And that's what they have seen happening, but they do things a little bit different. So let's look at chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. So, so far in this story, nothing's wrong Okay, if you sold a block of land, I wouldn't expect you to come and bring it to the church, right? So I wouldn't expect you to take your whole paycheck and bring it here to the church. That's There's nothing wrong so far with this story. They sold property. They want to give some to the church, to the cause. That's wonderful, and they've done that. Okay, but this isn't the end of the story. There is more to the story. Let's pick it up in verse 3. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it? that Satan has, has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit, have kept part, have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. So here we get a bit more detail about what's going on. So he's sold some land, he's brought some money, but what he has done is he has made it appear 
or he has said, I've sold this property and I've brought it all to the church. But that's not the case. He took some of the money, kept it to himself, and he wanted to appear that he was doing what Barnabas had done, what other people in the church had done. He wanted to appear um, that he had been given more than what he had. Okay, what sin is this? It talks the sin of lying. He's lied to God. He's lied to the Holy Spirit. But it's the sin of hypocrisy. It's the sin of wanting to appear as something that we're not. One of the, the biggest um, complaints of the church that I've heard is that we are, the church is full of hypocrites. All right? Not, anybody ever heard somebody say that? Oh, the church is just no different than anyone else. It's full of hypocrites. So I see people who go to church, and then I see them in the community, and they, they're no different. They're just hypocrites. Or we, we see some of the, the horrible things that have gone on in the name of church and religion um, to throughout history, and that people say, look what the church has done. Look at the Royal Commission. Look at those things. The church is doing those type of things. They're just a bunch of hypocrites. They're doing the wrong thing. That's what people look at the church. And they see the church, and they look at all our faults. And you're looking at someone right now who has faults, right? So there are, I'm not a perfect person. I have been saved by a perfect um, person, Jesus. But I am not a perfect person. And we in the church aren't perfect. But here in the story, we see Ananias and Sapphira. They are trying to appear as someone they're not. They're trying to be more spiritual. They're trying to not let people know what's really going on. Had they just said, look, we sold some property. We wanted to give part of it to the church. Then there would be nothing wrong. But they lied to the church. But that didn't really matter. The real matter was they were lying and deceiving um, before God, before his spirit. And so there was some very severe consequences of what happened in this time because of what they did. So let's pick the story up in chapter, or sorry, verse five. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. It's a pretty severe consequence. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. You know, the Bible doesn't say how Peter knew the information that he knew. Um, what, when I read it, I assume that God's Spirit gave him a, a gift of knowledge of, of what was going on in the heart of Ananias and in, the, in, the, in a few minutes in his wife as well. He saw what was going on. The Spirit let him know what these couple were doing. And as we look through the story, there's no definite yes or no. Were, were Ananias and Sapphira, were they believers? It, it talks about all the people who are following him. It doesn't tell us whether they were believers or not, whether these are people who, yes, they believed in Jesus, but they were falling into sin, or whether they were fake from the beginning. They just try, wanted to try to, to fit in and make things right. The Bible isn't clear, doesn't say about their faith before this. So we, we can only speculate whether these were people who had a faith. They, they, they believed the apostles' teaching. They repented of their sin, but now sin has creeped back in, or whether they never truly were uh, had put their faith in him. But the consequences of their sin was drastic. It says, Ananias fell down and died. And so we don't know whether, you know, an autopsy wasn't done on him, whether he had a heart condition and the stress of the situation caused him to have a heart attack, or whether God just said, you know what, your time's done, you know, and, and he dropped down. And, but he fell down and died. And so men came in, at the custom of the time, they, they didn't have... Um, they didn't embalm like the Egyptians of the time. So they, they would put bodies in tombs very quickly. So they took his body. They took him out. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Uh, I was listening to John MacArthur. He preached on this. He said, 
he thinks that probably the reason it took three hours for his wife to come, she was still working on her hair, it just took her a bit longer to, to get to the church service. So three ladies, three hours later, um, she arrives at the where the disciples were, whether that at this stage is um, the outer courts of the temple and the Solomon's colonnade, but she arrives and she comes. She didn't know what had happened to her husband. She came later. He had gone on before. And so Peter asks of her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias, and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, Th that is the price. Peter gave her the option. He gave her the, the opportunity to say, well, you know, maybe it was just Ananias. Maybe he was the one who, um, you know, connived all this. Would, would she say have the same story as he did? And she did. She said, yes, that is the price. So he would have had, this is the money we got, you know, a thousand dollars. I don't know how big the land was. You know, she said, yes, that's the price. And he knew immediately that she was lying as well because that wasn't the full price. And so we continue in verse nine. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen. The feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young man, men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. So... This has not ever happened at our church, but this is what happened in the early church. If hypocrites were to fall down and die in church services, you know, some of us might not have made it very far through the door. So what can we learn from this? Why has God moved in this way at this time with these consequences? And why do we not see that today? I don't know all those answers. I do my belief in why he has done this is he is showing the importance of, of recognizing sin for what it is, the importance of us to go and not let people live in sin. We, we live in a church culture. When I say church, I mean the organizational structure in this sense, the church structure of being very opening, welcoming, come in, which I believe we should be. We should be welcome all people into our church. We should welcome them in and we should share the truth with them. When people have put their faith and trust in Jesus, we are also commanded to, to walk beside people who are caught in sin or who are in sin. We are to go to people. If there's something we notice when there's sin in their lives, we are, are Talk, or told in Matthew 18 to, to go to those people, to, to talk with them, to, to say this is either what's going on between us or this is something I've seen that I, I'm concerned about in your life. And if, if they don't listen, um, you know, to take, you know, one or two others with you. And if not, to, to take it before the church. That's the example. That's the importance of what Jesus has told us for the church to be about sin. Should we be welcoming? Of course. You know, we want... Anyone who's interested in, in knowing anything about church, we should welcome through the door. But if someone's going to say, I'm a Christian, I put my faith and trust in Jesus. Well, we should lovingly encourage and build them up and point them to Jesus and, and work with them and point them point in their lives to their sin and then point them towards repentance from that sin. That is what we are called to do as the church. Peter, he has this word of knowledge of what Ananias and Sapphira did. You know, it could have been very easy to think, you know what? These people just gave a lot of money to the church. I mean, they've sold land. They brought, yes, yeah, just a percentage difference from what they said they brought. They said if they were going to bring 100%, they've only brought 80%. We don't know the percentage, but they've just given a huge sum. If I confront them, you know, what is that going to do? Are they going to get to the church? Obviously, God had a, another plan for them, apart from just reprimanding. But they were, but Peter 
saw sin. He knew what was happened because of, of God revealing it to him, and he wasn't going to just let it go under the radar. And we, as believers, when we see people sinning, we are to lovingly, caringly go to people and help them. The unfortunate, the sad thing is, is many times when we do that, we know where those people's heart is on whether they will accept it or not. There are two responses usually when you go to somebody who's in sin. One is a defensive, angry, how can you judge me type response, and that usually those people remove themselves from your presence because they of that. And a lot of times, I mean, there could be two, two reasons for that. One, either we do it in the wrong way, not in a loving way, or, or two, because their hearts aren't willing to accept the, the correction that they deserve, that, that needs to come to them. And the other response, and the response that we pray for and hope for is a, a heart of repentance. You know what? I'm so glad you came came to me. You pointed this out to me. You are right. I need to repent of this. I need to, to get right before God. I need to confess it to God. Um, please walk walk with me as I, I work through this. And that is the heart of a believer who wants to be to live a life that is representing Jesus, that live a life that allows God's spirit to work inside of him. <laughs> I, this is, I've talked through some of this already. We, as as his as believers, we we can either be hypocritical and try to point put ourselves in a position of being someone we're not, which is what Ananias and Sapphira did. They wanted to be holy and more generous than they were, um, and they they reaped the fruit of what they did. They were punished for what they did. We as believers, when somebody comes to us and points something out in our lives, our response should be to, to repent, to turn from, to, to welcome that. Is that easy? It's not always easy. When someone sees fault in us, we, we can feel judged. But as a pastor, my my job is to watch over, to care for the, the flock that God has brought, the people God has brought to this church. That's my role. Part of that role for me, part of that role for the elders is to care spiritually for people and to, to help people be right in their walk with God. And ultimately, they answer only before God, not before us. But people who put themselves under the authority of this church are also putting a, us together. And it's not just the role of the pastor and the elders. It's the role of believers to go to and not want sin to be prevalent in the lives of believers. And Peter did this, despite what it might have cost, despite what happened. He was not willing to overlook sin and people who were saying that they were believers. And this is great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Well, if I said to somebody, well, you're living in sin and they fell down dead, you'd probably be a bit fearful as well. Not Hopefully not at me, but of, of what God's doing. And that fear should be a holy reverent fear that I've seen Wow, God is serious about sin. God is serious about his church, about how he wants us to live and conduct ourselves. Are we going to be perfect? No. Look at me. I'm not perfect. We are not perfect, but we are called to live according to the way God has taught us through his word, according to the example that Jesus set. And when we make mistakes, we have to go before him and repent of them. If we wrong somebody, we go to those people and, and apologize and make things right. That's what we are called to do as believers. We're going to continue reading this next, next, next passage in verse 12. So this is what's happened in the church. Ananias and Sapphira have just died, been buried great fear, but this is the result of what's happened 
because of what Peter has done by 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 seeking holiness within the church of not turning a blind eye to sin, the apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade, Solomon's porch. We we looked at a map um, of the temple a few weeks ago. So it's just basic outer courts just had a little porch that um, overhang on the outside wall where they would have just been able to be in the shade. And that's where the, the apostles were teaching. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So Peter calls it out sin. He calls holiness within the church. He, want, he calls on people to be holy, to not be hypocritical, to live a life according to the principles that, the, that God has before us. And what is the result of that? The Lord added to their number. You know, if you think, oh, well, if we start calling out sin and we start challenging people on sin, well, people are going to leave. Well, people who aren't willing to stand under that that challenge, that um, light, if you want to call it. When we point light on someone's sin, they should be able to see that sin and repent of it. And that happened here. They saw what was happening. They knew what happened. They were filled with fear, reverent fear to the Lord because of who he was and the, the seriousness of his sin. But men and women were added to their number because they believed they saw what had happened and they grew not because peter was amazing but because the spirit was moving in amongst of them and they were listening to the spirit they were preaching through god's spirit and the lord added to their number as a result people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. God's working mightily at this time. This early church, this church that is unified, this church that is in one mind, this church that is not tolerating sin, that's confronting sin, and God is moving mightily. So what can we learn from these passages. One, don't sell land and don't tell me a different price if you bring it to the church. You can, can learn that. But we can learn that God does punish sin. And I want to say this with a disclaimer because there are some people that think anytime something bad happens in life that God is punishing them. And that's not the case. Yes, we can pray, Lord, is there something that's causing me to be go through this? We should pray that when bad things are happening. But many times the Bible is very clear that we are going to go through suffering. We're going to go through trials. And that's not punishment. That's not punishment of us. But God punished Ananias and Sapphira for what they did. For lying to the spirit, to lying to God. Of this hypocritical act of trying to be like Barnabas. Try to be popular. Try to be more spiritual than they were. But God does punish sin. And we don't like to think about that. We like to think of the God of love who's caring. And God is loving and caring. But when my kids do the wrong thing, am I a better parent if I punish them? Or am I a better parent if I just let it go? I'm a better parent if I punish bad behavior, our wrong behavior, our unbiblical behavior. That's my calling as a parent to guide and direct. And God does that to us as well. And so can we be punished for our sin? Yes, we can. Is all bad things happen punishment? No, because we go through trials and things. Should we pray, Lord, um, things are just not going real good right now. Is there something in my life that sin that I need to repent of and turn from? Yes, we should do that. But many times we're just going through times of trials, suffering, hard times, difficult times. But there can be times where the Lord points, you've been prideful. You've been greedy. You've been a hypocrite. You've tried to appear 
very spiritual when that's not you're really struggling in your faith. You know, and you just need to turn and draw close to me, or you get other people involved to help you out in this. And the Lord, through His Spirit, will speak to us, will help us in those times. So God does punish sin. We should know that the church isn't perfect. You know, that just goes without saying. We're filled with, the church is filled with people. Can we be unified? Can we be of one heart and one mind? Yes. If the early church did, that can happen for us as well. And we should be welcoming. We should be caring. We should be accepting. You know, if someone walks in from the street, you know, then we should welcome them, warts and all, you know. But we can't leave them there. We need to teach them the truth. We need to show them God's word and biblically and lovingly address sin. And particularly if they're ready to become a believer. If someone is, is says, I'm a believer, I'm a Christian, I, I'm part of this church, then we, we have a biblical model of how we should deal with sin in believers. And how we should deal with it in a loving, caring way, but going to the person, not allowing them to be in their sin. Because we want God to move. We want to see people come to know the Lord. And we, as the local body here, you know, we, we see the church as a body. And when part of the body is not well, when part of the body is not functioning, it affects all the own. Stu, if you're watching, I'm going to use you as an example. His knee was swollen with an infection. And because his knee is out, it has affected how he walks. The infection has spread in other places, but when one thing's off, it has affected his whole body. It's put a lot out in his body. And when the body of believers, when we are not in one mind, one accord, when we behave like the Corinthian church suing each other, it says they are already defeated. They're already defeated. So we as God's church should see sin for what it is, not, not be willing to accept it in the lives of believers. Yes, be caring, loving, accepting. We have God's word that show us how we are to live, and not in a judging way, but in an encouraging way to go to others to Ask them to repent, not to us, but repent to God, to be right with him, so that we can be a body that's unified, a body that's functioning the way it should, so that we can see God's hand moving in amongst us and see others come to know Jesus because of the spirits moving in our lives and in the lives of others. Let's pray. Father, well, this is a, a challenging passage to look at, where we we see straight up punishment of the sin of Ananias and Sapphira. We see the immediate punishment of that sin. And Lord, I, I think of my life, and there's there's been times where I've tried to appear more spiritual than I was. Lord, there's been times in all of our lives where we let sin back in. And Lord, we are living in a, a, a sinful world. But we, if we put our faith and trust in you, we have been made a new creation. Lord, you have died for us. You've taken the punishment of this sin. Lord, when we put our faith and trust in you, Lord, you give us your spirit to help us, to be with us. Lord, help us to seek righteousness, to seek holiness, to live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's not an easy calling. Lord, it takes us working together of encouraging, of correcting each other, of being humble when someone corrects us, of seeking our own hearts to see 
where the sin is. Lord, we see the Spirit moving in amazing ways. We see people healed. We see people coming to know you in this early church. We see them united. Lord, we pray that for the church of today. We pray that for our local church. Lord, help us to to see sin as seriously as you see it. Help us be loving and caring towards each other as we seek to grow in our walks with you, as we seek to point each other, not towards ourselves, but towards you. Lord, I pray that your spirit would move in our lives. You'd move in us and through us. And Lord, you'd move in the lives of that we would see people come, place their faith and trust in you. See people receive the grace that you have given through Jesus Christ on the cross.